welcome to the third in our series of Peace Fellow Conversations. Uh, I'm James Traub, and uh, our guest this evening is David Harland. Uh, David is the executive director of the Center for Humanitarian Dialogue, which is a private organization which seeks to end, prevent, or mitigate conflict through uh, diplomacy and reconciliation. It's also a super secret organization that basically never tells you what it's doing in the lesson until it has succeeded. And even then, they don't tell you very much. So I'm hoping that David, in the course of his comments, may divulge a thing or two. But uh, otherwise, I'll have to tell you a little bit about who David was before then, because that's more a matter of public record. So David was, when I first met him about 15 years ago, one of the pers people who was widely known to be among the most brilliant and gifted members of the UN peacekeeping staff. And so far as I know, the only one who was able to flourish there with a heightened sense of the ridiculous. Uh, so David served in, uh, sort of specialized in serving in really hopeless post-conflict situations. He and I first met in East Timor, which was by far the most hopeful and encouraging one. Uh, he also served in Kosovo, in Bosnia, and in Haiti. Uh, more important, I think, than any of those is the fact that David is the author of the Shre 1999 Srebrenica Report, which was the UN's own report on the worst atrocity in Europe since World War II. And it is the most scorchingly honest document written by the UN about the UN, I believe, in the organization's history. So, so David has had really an extraordinary career. And um, don't be put off by his pervasive irony. He's a deeply serious person who really does the work of the Lord. So David? Now, so my uh, topic tonight is, is warfare. Uh, the, the state of warfare in, in the world. Um, now, actually, uh, Jim asked whether we'd talk about our organization. Actually, we, we don't, of course. And you know, the, uh, President Clemenceau uh, once said, in the international system, there are no general cases. There are only specific cases. So I only want to talk about the general cases. So um, I'll get straight into it, if I may. I, I will divide these remarks into uh, four parts to try and go over how is war being fought at the macro level in our world today, and what are we trying to do about it, and what should we be trying uh, to do about it. So let me start with uh, what is broadly the, the good news. Um, and that is what happened uh, to the trends, the overall direction of warfare in our world, um, until 2010, uh, take, taking as my starting point, uh, first of all, the end, end of World War II. This is a famous graph, and on the y-axis is measured uh, annual battlefield deaths uh, in hundreds of thousands since the end of World War II. And there are four interesting things about it. Um, the first, of course, is that a colossal number of people, uh, close to a million a year in some years, died in the years immediately after World War II, each year on the battlefield. And that was basically driven by the Chinese Civil War and then by the, the Korean War. There's then a sort of pause, and then the wars of Indochina, the Vietnam War, the wars of colonial liberation uh, dominate the 1960s and 70s. Another pause, and then the third spike there is the, the final spasm of the Cold War, largely driven in Central America and, and wars in, in uh, Africa. And then there is something really dramatic, which is, if you believe Steven Pinker of Harvard University, uh, that flat line at the, at the end that comes basically after the, the war ends in Bosnia in 1995, represent among the lowest levels of interhuman organized interhuman violence ever. So Stephen Pinker has gone back uh, to Neolithic uh, periods, and his work has been scrutinized by people from many disciplines. 
and it's um, withstood a lot of very robust criticism, that we have never been that non-violent to each other as we were in that flat line you can see there from the mid-1990s till the period uh, about five, six, seven years ago. Now, just for those of you who happen to be interested in statistics, I should say there are people who very violently oppose measuring wars by battlefield casualties. Uh, and so all I want to say without getting into that debate for those of you who are professional uh, social scientists is that actually the basic point I'm making, which is that the Cold War was extraordinarily violent and then dramatically less violent after it ended, is actually borne out whichever way you look at the data and whichever data sets you look at. Uh, this is um, warfare as measured by numbers of civil wars uh, and then years uh, there. And there are social scientists who say even thinking of warfare in isolation is not right and you should look at it in terms of you know, democracy and other forms of, of well-being. And so this is just one of them. The, the black dotted line uh, in there uh, is the end of the Cold War. The uh, red line is autocracies, um, and the blue line uh, is democracy. I won't talk about the black line, because uh, this is a short talk. But the, the, the red line, as you can see, autocracy largely follows battlefield deaths. It largely follows the general patterns of warfare. It rises and rises and rises during the Cold War, and then it plunges. And then the, the blue line is almost the, the mirror image of it. it. Democracies during the Cold War grew much less slowly than the number of countries in the world was growing. So in other words, the proportion of democracies in the world fell throughout the post-Cold War period and then soared. So um, by the end of the uh, Cold War period, uh, the Francis Fukuyamas and the American thinkers were saying, actually, there was no more debate about what a human political and economic order uh, should look like. Um, war was viewed during this post-Cold War period. So I'm moving away from post-World War II and just considering post-Cold War period. As war was seen as a function of poverty. And in, on the y-axis of this slide, you see the absolute number of people in our world living in extreme poverty by the World Bank definition of $1.25 income a day. The numbers go from one and a half billion at the end of the Cold War to about 200 million. It's the greatest success story in human history, uh, largely driven, of course, by the Chinese autocracy. But uh, that's a subject for another lecture, I suppose. Um, and, but what is alarming about it is that if you map over that, which is the number of people who live in poverty in countries uh, at war, uh, or fragile states in the World Bank definition, actually it doesn't change at all. So over time, you see in our world, apparently, warfare disappearing, except in very, uh, very poor places. And this led to a whole approach to warfare uh, that I will give you a hint of the end, turns out to be completely wrong. It's what I call the, the liberal consensus. And uh, it's very much associated with uh, the World Bank World Development Report. And I'm sorry Bruce Jones isn't here because he's one of the authors of it. <laughs> but um, uh, the view was that uh, war was essentially a public policy problem. It was largely internal uh, to states between governments and it was a function of bad government and it was associated with poverty uh, and you could eradicate it the way you could eradicate death from smoking or airplane accidents perhaps not eradicate totally but you could by application of correct measures bring it asymptotically close to zero if you did three things if you provided physical safety stability if you provided a degree of prosperity, and if you waited uh, about a decade. And they had wonderful data in the World Bank way of doing this, which seemed to show it was true. This one I particularly like. If you take on the y-axis there is um, any group of countries at a certain starting point which you can choose. So I choose 1980. A group of countries at the same level of poverty. So the y-axis there measures poverty. If you then 
disaggregate them over time. So the red line is countries affected by violence, blue by some violence, and orange not by violence at all. What you see is a tremendous affirmation that violence and poverty are two sides of the same coin. That if you can break the, the trap, the vicious circle that connects bad governance to violence to poverty, you can make the world vastly better. Um, there are many ways of telling this story, and they all say the same thing. If you take two countries, here I take two countries that begin with B. Uh, Burkina Faso is the orange line and Burundi is the blue line. And their per capita GDP is marked on the Y axis. These are countries which start in a similar place, progress in a similar way, and then the red bars represent battlefield deaths in Burundi in the hundreds, so per year. So they're not very high levels of battle, battle deaths, but one thing you see immediately, and you can repeat this for any pair of countries which start in the same place in terms of income and then are uh, variably affected by violence, is that Burundi's per capita GDP declines sharply and immediately when the battlefield deaths kick in, and it never recovers even when the battle deaths end. So the end point after 50 years of independence is the two countries which begin at roughly the same place end at a point where one is twice as rich uh, as the other and twice as likely, therefore, to escape uh, future violence. Um, for those of us who are a very, very, very long time out of high school, um, you'll remember the uh, graph y uh, is equal to 1 over x squared, which looks almost perfectly like this. And um, on the y-axis is measured uh, here your likelihood of your country falling into warfare in the next 12-month period. And on the x-axis is measured how rich you are in per capita GDP. And there is an almost perfect, perfect, perfect correlation. What you see is that the poorer you are, absolutely the more likely you are to get. You take one step down the uh, per capita GDP ladder, and you take one step up the likelihood that you will fall into, into warfare. So it all seemed to be confirmed. And just, uh, I mean, I always ruin it by um, uh, somehow trying uh, to give one graph too many. Um, and this is a, an example of really one you shouldn't do in a public talk. But the, the, the black dotted line, the vertical line there sort of in the middle, is year zero for any war. It's the year at which the peace agreement is made. All the other lines represent per capita GDP. And each line in a different color represents uh, a different country at war. So the blue line, the blue dotted line, for example, is Nicaragua. And one thing you see more or less as a general rule is that when you start killing each other, you, your per capita GDP plunges. But the more interesting point, in a way, is what happens to the right of the black vertical dotted line. So that it doesn't all, for all of those countries, that year is a different year. But that is the year at which your war ends. What you notice on the right-hand side of that line is how long it takes to get back to where you were before you started killing each other. And there are no cases in which it takes less than 10 years. And this seemed massively to affirm the, the World Bank logic that you had to keep it calm, usually through peacekeepers. You had to uh, provide some economic growth to escape that uh, y equals 1 over x squared poverty trap. And you had to sit and wait there. And people said even the world's most successful countries, you know, the South Koreas and the Taiwans and the Malaysias and the Chiles, the countries which had gone from being autocratic basket cases to prosperous market democracies, all went through it over, over decades. They drew a graph, a spiral in the World Bank, which I never understood really. But it, it seemed to, uh, it was their poster child of, of how long you had to wait while you applied stability through peacekeeping, while you applied market reforms to grow the economy, um, 
and uh, you slowly grew uh, institutions, and then you would arrive, like Chile or like Taiwan or, or Korea, in, in this much better place at the, at the end. Now, the problem, and what I wanted to say at the sort of back third of this thing, is that it actually all seems to be wrong. Please look at the uh, right-hand end of all these graphs. And all the graphs I do uh, cover on the uh, x-axis the period from the end of the Cold War till now. And please look at the last five years. Uh, the World Development Report was published in 2011, just at the moment that the bus was going over the cliff. Uh, this is battlefield deaths since the end of, uh, for which I'm constantly criticized, but this is the battlefield deaths since the end uh, of the Cold War. Down and down and down and down, and then surge in 2011. You have Syria, you have Libya, and then later you have Iraq, you have Ukraine, you have a whole, uh, South Sudan, you have a whole range of conflicts. And now we're back up to where we were uh, not quite um, in the height of the Cold War, but we're, we're about at 100, getting towards 100,000 a, a year again. Uh, displacement, many of the humanitarians prefer displacement as a measure of how violent we are to each other. This actually doesn't have 2014. 2014 displacement numbers are just out. We've got to 40 million. We now have more people displaced in our world than we've had since the Korean War. Um, this is terrorism. The red line represents global total. The black line is the uh, Muslim majority countries. But just to show that it's not a Muslim majority phenomenon, please note that the rest of the world is the turquoise line, which shows basically the same pattern of a massive sharp uptick since 2010. Um, another phenomenon with which we live is the fact that during the Cold War, Belligerencies were sustained by popular constituencies based on ideology or identity and by external military and financial support. Uh, but just to give you a sense of how far we've got from that, this is total deaths by gunshot wound in Afghanistan over a five-year period. That is death by gunshot wound in Chihuahua state of Mexico over the same period where there's no political conflict at all. So what's going on? The first thing is that war and poverty are not connected to each other at all. S uh, Syria, Ukraine, Iraq, uh, Libya, so five of the top ten most uh, violent places in the world uh, now have various other things going on, but it's clearly not poverty. So what is going on? There is Henry, <laughs> of course, in a particularly avuncular uh, pose. One of the things that's going on is geopolitics is back. The World Development Report assumes that it's basically about poverty and bad governance. In fact, why Syria is so hard to solve is not because the Syrians are so difficult, it's because each of the factions is backed by one side of either the West versus Russia, Sunni versus Shia, political Islam versus the Sunni mainstream, one of the great geopolitical conflicts. We also have this integrated belt of ungoverned spaces which is mutually reinforcing each other since 2010. We have networks of crime and conflict that are perfectly aligned. So you get rid of conflict uh, uh, causes, political grievance in Colombia or Myanmar, but you have the same level of violence because the business model that underlies it of drugs is doing so well. You have a complete lack of confidence that military intervention is worth trying. Iraq, Afghanistan, the Western intervention in Libya in 2011, enormous disappointment in the policy community and among publics. You also have a world, this university probably proves it in a way, in which Western cultural, economic, intellectual domination of the world is passing and that that total domination, Western ideas are universal ideas, is now massively being challenged in every sphere, including the sphere of how countries should be governed. And China, Egypt, Thailand now have, and many others, very powerful counter-narratives. And finally, in the drivers, we have, of course, uh, and as young people, you're the most aware of it, we have young people very fluent with uh, 
enabling technology, social media basically, which are able to use these to assemble people to mobilize around grievance and able to remove governments and regimes. The dark side of this is of course nobody has figured out how to use those same technologies which can destroy something to actually build something. So, summarizing all that, we've got complicated warfare is what we've got. We've got the return of geopolitics, we've got, in, we've got transnationally integrated organized crime that is very hard to stamp out, and you've got Twitter revolutions which you basically can't negotiate with, can't mediate with, because actually they don't have a leadership, they don't have a corporate identity at all. What does this mean for the next uh, 10 or 20 years? I think, first of all, it clearly means fewer wars of choice, fewer international interventions. The fact that there has not been an intervention in Syria and the fact there hasn't been another intervention in Libya after the catastrophe of the post-Gaddafi meltdown is almost certainly a function of the earlier disappointments of the results of the Afghanistans and Iraqs and, and so on. So Mr. Assad, in a way, is the principal beneficiary of the disappointment in much of the international community with the results of the removal of Saddam Hussein and Gaddafi. Efforts to find stability without military intervention, counter-information, warfare, smart sanctions, and so on, but it's not getting very far. And finally, at least international consensus, moving away from very high standards of what Western countries in particular feel other countries should look like. If you look at Western governments, policy response to Egypt, Myanmar, Rwanda, you find much greater acceptance and much greater acceptance of a security agenda. So what are we going to do about it? Um, on there on the left, you have these problems at many layers, global, regional, national, local. We have the tragedy of Syria in particular, which is showing how all of these issues, global, regional, national, and local, are playing out. And in my view, the required response is similarly multi-level and, and multi-dimensional. And, and in my view, it's very possible. So just to give one tiny example, uh, Kenya. Kenya almost went over the cliff in 2008. Yet there was a public, official diplomatic response, a multilateral response. Kofi Annan was appointed the mediator of the African Union. There was a private sector, there's a minority elite in, in East Africa, generally of Indian ethnicity, which of course uh, minority elites always fear uh, massive violence and instability. So they control the media or a lot of the media and they were beaming very positive stability messages. And the public, the young people enabled by social media, were through this Ushahidi movement and others, using their mobile phones to tell members of the public about places where violence was erupting so it could be stamped out very quickly. So it seems to me basically the world we live in is more war, messier war fought at more levels, but there are corresponding policy tools. And just to finish, I think it's the last slide, on only, I think, I work for a tiny little organization that deals in the world of private diplomacy. But one of the things that we have found is that in this messy world, the thing we do, which is initiate contacts initially unofficially, which if they ripen can become official, which start discreet, very confidential, and then can become open, usually under somebody else's ownership uh, if needed, and start elite but can morph into something inclusive, is actually finding we have a higher success rate now than we had before this later round of problems erupted. And one which has got out quite far in the public is we mediated between uh, political Islam parties and uh, secular parties in Tunisia on power sharing and on uh, uh, the cycle of elections. And actually, this world of private diplomacy straddling official, unofficial, discreet, transparent, actually plays quite well to these, these new things. So um, just to end and say that it is almost certainly a period of greater violence uh, that is ahead of us in our world. It is certainly thornier because more factors have to be aligned at more levels 
before you can find a solution. No more Congress of Vienna where five kings arrive in a room and make an agreement and that brings peace to Europe for a hundred years. But the policy responses have, can and have to mirror the responses of the multi-layers of warfare itself. Thank you very much. So let's try to talk about some of these things. So I was trying to think this period of 2010, 2011, which you were describing as a kind of pivot moment. The first thing that occurred to me is that's when you became executive director of HD. You know, it's hard to know how, which way the causality runs there. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so I, I, it raises so many questions. One is, in, in effect, are you saying that we were living in a kind of false dawn for those years, uh, and there were very powerful dynamics in the world that took a while to be fully realized, uh, and those kind of, they go under a bunch of the headings you describe, but the first one you mentioned is the rise of geopolitics. Now, that in itself is not like a infectious disease that just happened. So when you use this term that suddenly this thing that we thought had gone away with the end of the Cold War is now back, and by the way, I just spent the last two days sitting through a conference that was held right across the hall there, that was exactly about the question of the rise of geopolitics. So it's something people are trying to think about a lot. Why? Why, why has this happened? Actually, I think it's a reversion to the norm. Uh, I think actually human history has always been about um, macro level clashes as long as we have existed in organized societies. I think Francis Fukuyama uh, and the idea that the, when the Soviet Union collapsed, that that collapse was so operatic. You know, for those of us who lived through 89, the Berlin Wall came down, the Soviet, the whole world seemed over, and it was just us, if I can speak as a Westerner, standing. And I think particularly in America, it made people completely delusional. And the sense that clashes of ideas wouldn't come back. The first sense of it, I think, was probably 9-11, that there were radical, Islamists willing to kill themselves and others in the name of a different vision. But it seemed almost insane. It almost was put in a different box. Uh, but then Putin pushing back basically is a wrecker uh, in the international scene, a spoiler trying to break the rules of the international system. And then, of course, there is the, the, <laughs> the rise of China, the famous Thucydides dilemma, which is that almost always in Chinese, in world history, as noted by Thucydides in the fifth century BC, the rise of one power to economically and militarily eclipse another is almost always associated with warfare. But it hasn't been in the case of China. Not yet. It's coming, coming to. But, what, so, <laughs> no, 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 let's stop there. Because, no, no, yeah. no so, yeah. but I want, uh, let's, let's stop there because, yeah. because That's I mean, it, it, it's the fact that the, what ought to be the chief source, in the Thucydidean sense, the chief source of an upsurge in violence, which is the uh, an unprecedentedly rapid rise of a power which also happens to be the most populous country in the world, in fact has been peaceful, though turbulent, though actually it's, it's the, what could be, we don't know, the death throes of a declining power, which is Russia, which has led to the yeah. violence. And so why is it that this one immense geopolitical event, the rise of China, has been, has been turbulent but peaceful, whereas this other one has been violent? First of all, took 40 or 50 years for Sparta to take on the Delian League. So uh, we still have time uh, with China. In fact, I think if we weren't being filmed, if we were just you know, chatting over a cup of coffee. Which we'll is make-believe we are. Yeah. yeah. I would bet you the, a, Everybody just, OK, just David and I talking I would, here. I would bet you a dollar yeah. that in the next 10 years, there will be a military clash involving China in the South China Sea or in the East China Sea. So either either with Vietnam or the Philippines or with Japan over the Diaoyutai Senkaku uh, 
Uh, I must say, if, if that's right, I mean, certainly if there is a serious military clash between China and Japan, that would be the first time since World War II that two countries which would properly be described as great powers would actually have a direct military conflict. That's a very frightening thought. Yeah, I have to say, I think the most likely one is um, uh, China-Philippines. Yeah. I, I think China sees the Philippines as the soft target uh, for its ambitions in the South China Sea. And I think that because the US backs the Philippines, it's the one which has the greatest potential for an accidental spiral. The, uh, Vietnamese, I, I don't know whether you invite them here, but the Vietnamese are preparing for war. The planning assumption of the Vietnamese government is that there will be a clash, and, and Vietnamese diplomats regularly uh, denounce China. Now they say, you know, for 2,000 years they've been attempting uh, to dominate us and we will push back. And I, I don't know. I, I, I would, but I would, or I would say is that the geopolitical stress is, is back, and there is the possibility of a clash. I think, frankly, Thorpe, I was just at this conference which had its ups and downs, but I think uh, the, there are in the United States and in China thoughtful people who are trying to manage it. But the fact is, with Thucydidean logic, that the issue is there and, and it's a driver of conflict and that conflict has a relatively high chance of becoming violent at some point. But I, I want to distinguish clearly between conflict and mm. battlefield deaths. Mm. So if you were to look at those numbers that you cited, Ukraine would be a very modest contributor to those numbers. It would not at all be a modest contributor to geopolitical conflict. It's an immensely consequential battle. But the numbers come chiefly from one region. They come from the Middle East. Uh, is that not right? Uh, yeah, well, Ukraine is, is now between 5 and 10. The, the battlefield casualties last year uh, were approaching 100,000. Syria very strongly dominates yeah. at about 60,000. Iraq is there at about 30,000 for 2014. And South Sudan and Ukraine make both of the balance. So. Uh, Yes, you're, you're right, but I would also say that um, although China, uh, that particular geopolitical, the, the Thucydidean issue is not present in the Syria-Iraq thing, clearly one of the drivers, uh, or three of the drivers of, uh, of Syria in particular, uh, are geopolitical ones. The fact that because Russia backs one side, the West must back the other, Shia and Sunni and political Islam and, and uh, mainstream Sunni uh, governance. And so I think irrespective of where the conflicts are, and there will be different trigger points, some will be in Africa, some will be in Asia, what we have to understand is that unlike at any moment since the end of the Cold War, the drivers will largely be outside of the countries <coughs> themselves, which will make them much harder to resolve. So, so I, I want to move on to the sort of question of solutions in a minute, but just sort of one more question on this, because I think that's a very important uh, thing to say and way to look at it. And, and I think what it says is that the view that the big thing that we're seeing is the collapse of a political order in the Middle East. And that it is a middle, it is above all a Levantine and North African phenomenon that these states, which were all, which never had strong legitimacy and essentially passed from the hands of one hegemonic power to another, the Ottomans, then the French and British colonials, then the Americans, and then when they were on their own, lasted for X amount of time and have now fallen apart in this unspeakable chaos. You're saying actually that's n the most salient fact is not so much this internal dynamic of collapse, but the way outside powers are exploiting that and, and this sort of, I guess, the larger Sunni Shia battle, things like that, not so much these internal political dynamics. Weak states are vulnerable to armed violence the way weak people, weak patients, are vulnerable to infection. 
as you said, the, the, um, the state was never a very strong unit of political identity in most of the, the Muslim world. With the exception of Egypt, the national identity is largely externally mm -hmm. imposed and, and, and generally quite new. And the, the levels of collective identity uh, tend to be quite different. They were held together uh, by these uh, autocratic strongmen, the, the Saddam Husseins and the Gaddafis and the Assads and the Salehs. And uh, those were, in that sense, the weak patient. And, and so these trends could easily carry them away. But those geopolitical stressors are there in Ukraine and they are there in, in South Sudan. And in my view, they are also there in the South China Sea and in, in Southeast Asia. So uh, yes, this uh, region is particularly affected. But in my view, uh, it's the harbinger of things to come. So if that's true, and we now move on to what in the world do you do, Clearly, one of the appeals of the it's poverty view was, hey, we can solve this problem. As you say, it's a public health problem, and we thank God we figured out the medicine. Right. And your point is, no, it turns out to be the medicine for the wrong disease. That's not the disease. And so if the problem is this, these geopolitical pressures, then you have to ask, what are the instruments that would change the calculus of the forces, the, the states, both the states and in some cases not just the states, that are enormously contributing to this violence. Um, private diplomacy, which is the line of work you're in, uh, inevitably is going to be a very modest contributor to that, right? Because a geopolitical problem, if it has a solution at all, is only going to have a geopolitical solution, i.e., somehow persuading Saudi Arabia and Iran that their interests are not so, that there is not a global competition for the domination of Islam. Smaller solutions aren't going to work, right? No, oh, that's right. I think. If, um uh, it's a mistake to focus just on the geopolitical stressors. Mm -hmm. I think um, the geopolitical stressors are there, and in the case in particular of uh, Syria, uh, also of, of, of Ukraine and, and of Libya, um, they are exacerbating factors. But in fact, even more fundamental drivers of those are, are accidental negative uh, byproducts of technology. Technology, social media technology in the last 10 years has accelerated the transfer of power from states and actually most large institutions to the, the individual. And Which in, sounds like a good thing. And in places where there is a natural level of identity with the, the state uh, and in open societies, those are generally good things. I mean, in my country, I mean, in New Zealand, I think most people consider the openness better. But in you know, Saddam Hussein's Iraq or Assad's Syria or Gaddafi's Libya or even in Mubarak's Egypt, it represented a, a transfer of power to people who discovered they could remove rulers that they didn't like, and they did. And, uh, and I think that genie isn't going back into the bottle. I very much agree. This is very much not an infomercial for the type of work that my organization does. I agree with your point that we will probably be only one part of the solution. I, I think that the big solutions will be a return to geostrategic diplomacy, which the Brookings folks who are here with you were wrestling with, not altogether successfully, I felt, so far. Uh, you only and, attended the end of the yeah, conference. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 the mass, and the mass movements. And, and I think that um, we have the beginnings of in the Ushahidis and, and so on, and there are some comparable ones in Ukraine, of public responses. But So I'm not absolutely despairing, and I'm not just focusing on the geopolitics, but I certainly agree that just as there will be multi-layers and several drivers of the conflict, there will have to be several quite asymmetric responses to most conflicts. But the Kenyans and Tunisians show that it, it can be done. 
So, but let's talk then about um, what one tries to do inside states. And here I'm going to ventriloquize Bruce Jones. So Bruce Jones, his name we keep throwing around, is an actual individual person um, who is uh, the uh, deputy head of foreign policy wing at the Brookings Institution and has been running this conference that uh, David has referred to and I have referred to more generously than David has uh, across the hall here. Um, and so people who, who think about these issues today, uh, including, I believe, uh, at the World Bank, the much maligned World Bank, um, I think now recognize that the causality uh, runs uh, backwards uh, from what they thought, or at least as much backwards as forwards, i.e., it is conflict that causes poverty as much as or more than poverty causes conflict. Um, and so now, when people are thinking about what are called the sustainable development goals, which are the new version of the millennium development goals, which were established by the UN in 2015, and these new things, the SDGs, are going to be written up in this September at the UN, uh, there is a new focus on what to do about fragile states. So there is a recognition now, I think, that didn't exist before, that uh, poverty is concentrated in fragile states because all of these things that cause state fragility are causing poverty, not the other way around. So I guess the question is, do you think it's kind of a vain pursuit to try to use development assistance and investment assistance and training and all the stuff the world does to specifically target state fragility so that you can, in fact, find ways of treating the patient directly, even if not the same way that people were trying to do before? Um, first, I would say, um, yes, you're absolutely right. The, the much maligned World Bank and the much maligned United Nations and the much maligned think tanks um, have, did not stop thinking in 2010. In a sense, the World Bank World Development Report was just unlucky. <laughs> they issued this absolutely sort of epic, almost definitive statement of how conflict works just at the moment when it was massively changing. But it wasn't their fault. And I, and I think as the years have gone by, I mean, they, have, they, have, uh, they have adapted. I think the complicating factor is that actually um, the previous caseload is still there. The, the poverty-driven conflicts are still there. It's just nobody cares about them anymore because these Twitter revolutions are so spectacular and the geopolitical crises are so, generate so much angst, you know, the, the Ukraines and the Syrias, that people have sort of forgotten about the Congos and the South Sudans, yeah. but they're, they're still there. So I actually, um, I actually think that the, the big institutions are much maligned, and I, and I don't think they've missed it. But uh, we do need a new set of poverty tools. They, they actually did very well. In my view, UN peacekeeping, World Bank Development Aid uh, massively contributed to the very low levels of interpersonal violence for that wonderful 15-year period. But now these stresses are back. That's not enough, and we need a whole new set of tools, Jim. And are there new institutions? That is to say, clearly, um, when, I mean, today in this conference we were talking about Russia, and there was this widespread acceptance that the institutional architecture, which means NATO, the EU, those things proved hopelessly unequal to the unexpected challenge that Putin posed. So does that mean that part of the solution is rethinking what those institutions are, or is that just kind of, I don't know, fiddling with the deck chairs on the Titanic or something? Um, geopolitical um, challenges such as Putin's challenge, uh, his decision to wreck Ukraine um, rather than let Ukraine drift westward, uh, that, that's a fundamentally geopolitical challenge that will have to be dealt with in geopolitical terms. And as you point out, it has not been dealt with. But I don't think other institutions would have dealt with it better. I think where it gets interesting is how to deal with the mass movement. So a lot of the events that precipitated uh, the uh, crisis in Ukraine were driven by the, this technology and the Maidan movement. And I think the um, we understood very little the consequences of, of the Maidan movement. And I think um, 
uh, the answer is not new institutions, but new understandings of how official institutions and governments interact with publics at large. Technology enabled publics. Right, but that's not going to, that, in terms of the uh, aggressive behavior of revisionist states, whether they're China or Russia or Iran, that's going to require a kind of resolve on the yes. part of, good old fashioned I mean, you resolve. know, people, it, it, again, at this conference, there was a continual call for American leadership, even if people disagreed radically about what they meant by American leadership. Yes, no, I agree with that. Uh, part of it is a return to, as you put it, old-fashioned resolve. Uh, Henry Kissinger, who has a photo I put there, has actually written a book which has a lot to disagree uh, with on uh, world order, uh, on the geopolitical challenges of the world, in which I think the, the West in particular has just become uh, uh, lazy and has lost a lot of will. And I think Putin launched a challenge to it that the, the political resolve was simply not there to, to confront. Well, and interestingly, you mentioned that. I mean, Kissinger's point in part uh, is people didn't believe there was such a thing as world order anymore. They saw a post-state world where the most important things were market forces, non-state actors. And so this whole idea of world order came to be seen as archaic and fusty. And I have to say, in many ways, I think it is. Uh, but there has been this return of the, not the rogue state, but the expansionist state which poses a threat to this thing, and the thing that poses a threat to is the world order. So I suppose those people who are on, who see themselves as the upholders of that order are gonna have to accept this challenge to the system. We had a generation where warfare was about bad governments fighting armed groups in its states, uh, in poor places. We now have, above that level, good old-fashioned geopolitics, interstate, interblock uh, politics in several dimensions, from the Sunni Shia to the, uh, to the East-West. Uh, and we have these technology-driven popular movements. My only point, really, is not that I have a great answer to them all, but that th none of these problems are going to go away unless they can be addressed at each of those levels. And we do have relatively promising tools, but we certainly have to discard the model which says it's about policy, it's about poverty and a set of policy responses that almost assume away politics both at the super national level and at the level of the people. Well, let's you and I stop there. I imagine there must be a question or two out there. Jamil Mohammed from uh, ECAE. Going back to the point you were making earlier on and the analogy you gave of um, a weak person uh, more susceptible to uh, illnesses, and I'd just like to extra uh, extrapolate from, from there that these weak governments are weak because of external ideas such as nationalism and secularism which weren't originally, which weren't origin, uh, um, the origin wasn't sort of a natural organic origin there. Uh, the real natural organic origin is the Islamic identity. I mean, that's the, the real na natural there. On, on the other side, you have this geopolitical uh, aspect of it there, whereby uh, first world powers, external powers, are trying to impose their own ideas. So therefore, a country will not be successful unless you adopt those liberal Western ideas. And we saw this in the past, uh, in, in the Cold War time, where you had Chile, democratically elected government there. The Americans went in, helped to overthrow the democratically elected government there. In Iran, in 1954, over there, we saw that the mess Sir, in Sir, could I just America, ask you to come to the question mark? Yeah, no problem, okay. yeah. What do you think of these ideas? Question mark. <laughs> Thank you. you know, I, I agree with that. That the um, the export of uh, of all the uh, of all the wonderful and miserable things the West has exported uh, nationalism uh, as the defining unit of identity. The nation state is the defining unit of identity. It is probably uh, one of the most harmful. It, it by the way, uh, I mean as 
for example, Germany proved from 1933 to 1945, hasn't always been wonderful even at home in, in Europe. Um, so I certainly agree that in, in places where the nation state is not a natural unit of identity, there will be much lower levels of resilience to these various shocks. I, I think, actually, I agree with almost everything you said. And do you think that, that in terms of the gentleman's point about Islamic identity, that in these states, it will be necessary to find a way of accommodating Islamic identity? I think that um, in, um, there, are, there, are, there, is a comp there is a contending, two contending ideas, right? One is that the state structures are there, are rather artificial, and in these days of empower technology-empowered populations, it's hard for artificial constructions to withstand much more natural ideas. Like in, in this region, the basic sense of an ummah is the sort of natural locus of, of, uh, of corporate I identity. On the other hand, there is the point that the African Union has, re or the OAU as it then was, has rescued, uh, wrestled with, which is the Pandora's box problem, which is if you say, okay, these borders and these states are not organically very natural to us. On the contrary, they're rather unnatural and imposed by us, on us very unhelpfully by our former colonial masters. If you then try the process of unraveling that 100 or 150 years of history and recreating something which is more organic, it can be a terrible and awful and bloody uh, process. So uh, I, I don't know what the big answer to your question is. I know that in the four or five countries which have been most affected by uh, the so-called Arab Spring or Arab Awakening, only one of them, uh, which is Tunisia, has, has managed to navigate uh, to an inclusive political order. And that is one in which it was accepted that uh, an irreducible and large part of the population feels political Islam as its basic identity. And it, a decision was made that they would try to engage with that. And for the moment, there is a stable political order. But you would have to say, I think, as they used to say in America, watch this space. <laughs> <laughs> yes, anyone from this side? Yes. Wait for the microphone. Thank you. Um, my name is Tom White. I'm a, I'm a biz local businessman. We've talked a lot about um, fear and downward spirals and what creates a, um, a, a fertile place for, for conflict. I'd like to ask a question of hope. We now live in a technological society. What new technologies do we have to develop? in order to prevent political vacuums descending into physical warfare, what technologies do we have to develop to allow peacekeeping to be in the virtual space before it has to be in the physical space? I think you're, you're business, you will be the richest businessman in town if you uh, <laughs> find the answer to that question. I, I think it's an excellent question. I, I mentioned in passing that one of the accidental uh, byproducts, tragic byproducts of social media is they turn out to be fantastic tools for overthrowing governments, but they're not at all good tools for constructing something. We have in the Ushahidis the beginnings of technology which can mobilize publics. Can you explain what that is? So it, this uh, instrument in Kenya, where the, the public used mobile phones to, uh, whenever the, a violent incident was reported in a particular village or a particular place, mobile phones would report to a central space, and that would be then broadcast out again by mobile phone, by SMS message and Twitter, Facebook, then, or before Facebook, then, and, and uh, positive political actors could enter the state space very quickly. So I, I super agree with where the question is coming from. I think there are the glimmers of answers, um, but I, I wouldn't uh, dare to have uh, more, than, uh, more than that to say on it. Though I guess if one talked about instruments, not technologies, you would say private diplomacy. I mean, HD is not a technology. It's, it's a new kind of instrument that didn't exist before. 
Yes, and I, I would say in my last slide, I mean, there are new forms of diplomacy. I mean, we represent one of them. I think also interstate diplomacy is also changing in some ways, um, in which um, it is, I mean, the Tunisia case seems to be a promising one, in which there, it is possible to reach accommodations that people thought were not, not possible and then to engage the public through mass technology as happened in, in Tunisia in a positive way. But I, I have to agree, I think, with the Oshka Fisher, which is the, the turmoil is so great that it, it, I think it's very hard at a point in history to say this place is an awful disaster and, and this one is a model of how it's going to be sustained. But Jim's point, which is I think that there are institutional responses, there are the beginnings of technological responses, there are certainly responses among the public at, at large uh, utilizing these tools that do give us room for, for hope. But for the moment, the, the horsemen of the apocalypse are, are ahead of the, uh, the, the better angels. Uh, my name is Harry Roberts, I'm an engineering consultant. A huh. uh, question for David. Uh, again, a question of hope, I, I, I trust. Uh, you seem to have had some success in negotiations that you've concluded, 23 or 29, I think was the number that you put up there earlier. Uh, I'm interested, first of all, in which areas um, you actually acted, geopolitics, organized crime, or Twitter revolutions, and whether there are common triggers and common success factors that you've come across that can be applied to bring those negotiations to a successful conclusion. Yes. Um, there is a common pattern. In the areas where my little organization and similar such organizations, there are about half a dozen in the world, um, the areas where they succeed is almost always between states and organized non-state actors. That is, large separatist rebel groups or uh, uh, similar uh, constructions. Where I think, um, and it comes to Tom's question or to our original question, where I think it's not a tool that is proved to be very adaptable is, or Jim's skepticism, is at the geostrategic level that space is still dominated by the traditional actors. One thing that struck me at the Brookings Conference is the Chinese often repeat, in fact, we need more of a return to state-centric classical uh, diplomacy. Um, and also the tools we deal with are not very perfectly adapted to uh, this new shift of power to the people. So I think organizations such as mine find relatively few successes among the truly atomized conflicts. There have been a lot of attempts in Somalia, for example, um, but it's simply too fragmented and the groups are too tiny. And Libya may be moving that way, uh, unfortunately. So the broad answer is yes, there are certain categories where each tool seems to work. And our little tool seems to work best at the level of states and organized non-state armed actors, usually of a separatist or nationalist variety. Uh, I'm Mastish, I'm a student here. Um, my question goes back to the causal relationship that uh, we were talking about between poverty and um, bad governance and, and conflict. And I think there are still challenges to this um, assumption that that trend is reversing with the you know recent conflicts because I see it still people draw associations between um, lack of employment opportunities and, and you know use uh, disenfranchisement within cities leading into um, political uprising. And we've also seen trends in this region, some countries w which are more susceptible to political popular uprising having um, to deal with those poverty-related problems. And I also want to add to that this relationship between terrorism and, um, again, youth and, uh, dissatisfaction. So we, I feel like there's still a strong association in that respect that challenges the, the shift that you're proposing. And I want to hear your comment on that. Thank you. Um, well, certainly, this graph shows your point perfectly, that at least until 2010, poverty, violence, bad governance, and corruption massively reinforced each other. 
which direction the causation went. Luckily, I'm not a scholar, I'm not a professor, I don't have any uh, research tenure to gain. Uh, I don't know. And f for professionals in my field, it probably doesn't matter. All you have to know is that there is an absolute, almost uh, beautifully y equals 1 over x squared correlation. That, so somehow uh, that drove the idea that you had to suppress them all at the same time and then some countries, the Timors or whatever, would emerge. Um, but the fact is that since 2010, most of the people who have died uh, in armed violence in our world have died in middle-income countries. So um, I don't know if the mic still works if I stand up. But the people who are dying now are dying here. Uh, on, uh, there are still Congos and South Sudans. But the, it's the Syrias and the Iraqs and the Ukraines and the Libyan, the Libyas that are killing people. And there is something new going on in our world. And we can see through the fog roughly what it is. And it's messy and multi-layer. And unless, in my view, we grab uh, similarly asymmetric, messy, multi-layer tools to respond, we will get a lot more of them. But thank you very much. Well, David, uh, you know, we live here in Abu Dhabi in a very fortunate world, and so sometimes it's not that easy to grasp how turbulent, messy, and chaotic the world beyond that border is. But I think you've reminded us of that in a dazzling way. So, so thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me.